Thank you, Jesus. Well, again, let me ask if you remember the title of the teaching. Anybody? Sure, Marianne. Life from a Christian perspective. Correct. Life from the Christian perspective. There are alternatives. There are plenty of <clears throat> uh, other ways of looking at life, facing life. Um, I'm walking up the lane and across <clears throat> the lane, we have uh, a lot of Indians playing cricket. These would be Muslim Indians, right? Yeah. We know in India there are also Hindus, aren't there? Yeah. And they all have their own way of looking at life, don't they? Yeah. So there are many options, aren't there? But certainly not many correct ones. There are plenty of people that believe that there are many correct ones. You can live life as you choose. And uh, they're all okay, equally acceptable. Equally acceptable should be considered equally acceptable to reasonable human beings. Um, uh, the God that they believe in, they say that uh, these alternatives are equally acceptable to him. So the Muslim believes that if you, <clears throat> if you, do, uh, if you do good, live a good life, then maybe Allah will welcome you into uh, some uh, peaceful, uh, tranquil, blessed, eternal state. They're not sure, but because you can't be sure with Allah, uh, but they're hopeful, right? In the Hindu, they believe that, well, I'm not real sure what they believe. <laughs> they believe that you are to do good, and if you do good, uh, then maybe you'll be reincarnated in a uh, higher state in the next round. And ultimately, uh, through uh, many repeated reincarnations, you will hopefully come to a place of nirvana, eternal bliss, uh, mindlessness. Uh, you're just lost in a positive, an, a positive uh, favorable energy state where your soul is incorporated into the souls of, of the positive energy of the universe. <clears throat> Something along those lines. <laughs> I, you know, was, uh, well, we, we think of uh, life from a Christian perspective set over against non-Christian, but there are plenty of professing Christians that hold unbiblical Christian perspectives. Sad we've got to qualify what kind of Christian, Christianity we're talking about, right? We've got to talk about biblical Christianity, evangelical Christianity, born-again, spirit-filled evangelical Christianity. And then we've got to go with the qualifiers to, to, to know what kind of Christianity we're talking about. Well, for you all, I talk to people who understand the kind of Christianity that we're discussing here. It's, it's a Christianity that's found and based and established on the Word of God. Amen? Amen? Jesus is Lord. And when we talk about uh, life from a biblical perspective, that... that that's where we get right back to foundations, isn't it? I'll mention briefly. I mean, I, I grew up um, for the first number of years in my life a Roman Catholic. Christians, in, in, to, to many people's uh, understanding, do you consider uh, Roman Catholics to be Christians? Highly unlikely. Most of them not. I wouldn't stand here today and say, nope, there's not a born-again Roman Catholic. There are probably some born-again Roman Catholics. But... Uh, People who believe the Bible to be the inspired, infallible word of God uh, aren't quick to consider that Roman Catholics are Christians, right? Because you know what it is to be a Christian, according to a biblical standard. And you recognize, though these people say they're Christians, and they have crosses on their, in, their, in their churches, don't they? And they have Bibles, with many of the same words in them, most of the same words they've got. Their Jerusalem Bible, their Douay Bible, is very similar to the Bible that we use in many respects. They've got some extra books, and some of the verses read a little bit differently, but they've got Bibles like we've got Bibles, don't they? Yes, they do. Yeah. But they believe things about God that are inconsistent with God's revelation of himself. And so, uh, and, and certainly with regard to the person of Jesus Christ and the way of salvation, we differ radically, dramatically, don't we? 
because the Roman Catholic believes that, yes, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the whole world, but you're saved not just by placing your trust in what Jesus has done, but you are saved in part by what you do. And so there's a radical departure there from biblical doctrine, isn't there? So when we talk about life from a Christian perspective, we're talking about life as, as true Christians, biblical Christians, born-again, spirit-filled, Bible-believing, evangelical Christians, <laughs> the way they live their lives. You with me there? Yeah. Life from a Christian perspective. Do you know what you believe? And why you believe it? We started out in this study talking about our belief in there being one true God. One true God. Not many gods. Not, not, not many gods. Um, uh, there are those that would accuse you of being polytheistic because you believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But you know that that's not the doctrine of the Trinity. Though it is a mystery, difficult to understand, it is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Amen? He's one. He's one. And he is revealed in three persons, and I don't understand that. Because they're plain and distinct. But we're not polytheists. We are monotheists. We believe in one God. Amen? And we believe that, that one God is, is the only God. <clears throat> we believe in one, and it's not like um, our religion is chosen to believe in just one. We're monotheists, but we acknowledge that there are other gods. No, because that could also take place, couldn't it? Uh, any, different, any, any given people or culture could be uh, monotheistic, that is to say they could worship one god, but they could acknowledge the existence of other gods for other peoples and other cultures who might be polytheists themselves or might be monotheists themselves. But we believe that there is one true God and uh, he has revealed himself in the scripture, Jehovah, Yahweh, right? Just one true God, the I am that I am, the existing one, the ancient of days. And there are no other gods. The God of the Bible says that he knows not any others. He doesn't recognize any others. He's been around forever and he says, I know not any. I'm the only one, he says. And you have taken God's record of himself to be true, haven't you? Yeah? So that when people say there are many paths to God or there are many gods, we all, you know, worship the same God or, you know, just so that you have some, some God concept that's all acceptable. No, you say, no, that's not acceptable because it's inconsistent with what the Bible has to say. Life from a Christian perspective is lived in accordance with the, the scripture. Amen? Amen. And so you came upon this because that's the culture that you were brought up in, right? You were fed it to you, you sucked it out of your, you know, your thumb as a child, and so you're a Christian. <clears throat> mm -mm. I just told you I was brought up a Roman Catholic, and I'm not a Roman Catholic anymore. Some of you were brought up just good old heathens by parents who did not believe in God at all. And um, what you would have got from them would have been, you know, that kind of understanding. But you have come to know the truth. So we're not Christians culturally. We were having this conversation the other day with some regarding uh, Jews. And, you know, sometimes uh, Christians uh, naively think that somebody, because they, you know, uh, uh, claim to be a Jew... You know, they, they, they really believe that there's a coming Messiah and there's really a God in heaven and, the, and, and what we would refer to as the Old Testament is their Bible. And no, no, they don't believe any of that stuff. But they would claim to be Jews. Well, they're just cultural Jews. You understand that, right? Now, the guys who wear the little yarmulkes around, now, those, those guys believe there's one true God and, the, and what we would call the Old Testament is the Bible, the inspired word of God. Even there, you know, they're not so sure about um, how completely inspired it is. Some books more inspired than others. And there's, again, just as in any religion, lots of sects. Any religion that's been around for any length of time has got sects, don't they? Yep, they sure do. Uh, <clears throat> well... One God, who sent his only begotten Son into the world. We believe that there is one God. And then we went on from there and we talked briefly, very, very briefly, about some of God's qualities or attributes. We believe that God is love, don't we? We believe that he's, he's a good God, this unseen, eternal being that, 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 that has made us. 
that rules over all. His disposition toward humanity is one of mercy and kindness. He takes delight in pardon. He's not, some have depicted him as being uh, uh, one who delights in wrath, a, a, a perverted or, or morbid gratification that he would derive from damning people to hell. <clears throat> Just messes around with people's lives and, uh, and, uh, and then takes pleasure in zapping them or sending them to hell. And, and that's not consistent with the Bible record. What we know about God is that he is a good God, a kind God, a merciful God. We also talked about he's, how he's a holy God. Amen? Yep. He's a holy God. He's pure. And from there, he requires his people to be pure and holy before him, to show him the kind of reverence and honor that he is due. And people choose to do so to the extent that they choose. <clears throat> but God is a holy God. There's, there's, he's unique and he is pure and clean. There's no unrighteousness in him. There's no darkness in, in him at all. Amen? Amen. And these are things that we know about. He's very merciful. We sing <clears throat> hymnody, much of which is rich in sound theology. And we, th we sing of God's mercy and his kindness, don't we? Yes. yes, we do. Yeah, because we believe those things to be true about our God. There are some people, professing Christians, perhaps born-again Christians, that believe that, that God is merciful, but if you mess up, then you fall from favor with him. That's inconsistent with the Bible. Born-again Christians shouldn't believe that way, should they? Should they? No, they shouldn't. They think that, okay, I've messed up lately, and so God doesn't like me as much as he used to like me. Or might, as much as he might like me if I were better, did more good for him. That's unsound, isn't it? That's not life from a Christian perspective, is it? Oh, oh, but I'm a Christian. Pastor, didn't you just acknowledge that I could be a Christian and struggle with those? Yes, I did. But that's not living life from a Christian perspective. That is to say the perspective isn't that sound. A biblical Christian perspective isn't that soundly established in your heart and mind and your thinking, is it? No, you, you're continuing to labor under misconceptions regarding who God is and what he is like. Right? Something that you came up with on your own somewhere or that somebody fed you somewhere. Devil, inspired, but inconsistent with the truth of God's word. So we don't want to live that way, do we? No, I really love the Lord, but I messed up and I don't think that he can ever forgive me. And, or, you know, he'll probably forgive me one day, but I should wallow in my own self-pity for a week or for a month or however long it is until I can get right with God and feel good about myself again. And, and where does that come from? Misconceptions regarding who God is and what he is like. Amen? For sure. So we, would, we don't want to live there, do we? Life from a Christian perspective is able is enabled by God, living life, from a Christian perspective, uh, we draw on the grace of God to freely receive the gift, the gift of forgiveness which is freely offered. And that's a blessing, isn't it? Grace, it means, the, the root word means gift, doesn't it? And do you pay for a gift? No. Nope, it's offered freely. The gift is given freely, isn't it? Yeah? Theologians refer to free grace. There's a lot of redundancy there. <clears throat> On that subject, I don't mind the redundancy. <laughs> it's free. You're freely, you're freely given <clears throat> the gift of mercy and forgiveness. And we know that uh, a price was paid, it's just that we didn't have to pay it. God paid the price that if you will, allows him to be just and the justifier of those who place their trust in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Because he paid the price. There is a death penalty for sin. And Jesus paid that death penalty. Amen? So among the things that we believe about our God, we believe these things, don't we? He's, he's, he's existing, he's good, he's loving, he is merciful. And we didn't, there's a whole lot of time we could spend the whole rest of our lives uh, talking about, literally, talking about attributes of God. But from there we went on and we talked on Wednesday night about God being our creator, didn't we? Yeah? Yeah. And there are those that do not like to retain God in their knowledge. Remember we were finishing up there in Romans 1, weren't we? There are people, they knew God, they knew him, but 
glorified them not as God, neither were they thankful. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God has revealed himself to all people. There's not a soul that walks the face of the planet and says, oh, I didn't know. They're not going to stand before God come judgment day. And that's what we're going to be talking about in a minute here. Judgment, judgment to come. But there's not a soul that's going to walk the, that walks the face of this planet and, and stand before God as their judge one day when life on earth is done and, and uh, eternity is before them. Say, oh, I didn't know you existed. If I had, oh, if only I had known you existed, I would have been more seriously about the way, serious about the way I lived my life. I would have lived a holy life. I would have lived a responsible life. I would have lived a, a moral and Christian life. I would have placed my trust in Jesus Christ if I knew you existed, but I didn't know you existed. <clears throat> That's not going to be the case. People know that there is a God. That's another perspective that many people try to live under. You know, we, we've talked of you know, Muslims and Hindus and Roman Catholics, and then there are atheists, right? There are lots of wrong perspectives of reality. There are people that deny the existence of God. I, you know, if there's a God, then there's accountability, isn't there? Hey, I got an idea. Let's do away with God. Do away with God. And, and we can do away with, with, with guilt and accountability, can't we? Well, if you could do away with God, but he's God. Just saying, oh, okay, hey, I got an idea. God, you don't exist anymore. And God says, oh, okay, if you say so. It's just not, it's just, I know, and we sit here today and say, that's insanity. Well, God says, the fool is said in his heart, Right? There is no God. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a pretty stupid thing, a foolish thing to do. To be biblical. Stupid sounds more, you know, more <laughs> graphic, you know, sort of drives the point home, but biblical, it's foolish to say that there is no God, to deny the existence of the one who, in your heart, you know, is there. And how do, how do I know you know? Because the Bible tells us that we all know, all men know. They just don't like to retain God in their knowledge. And in the context of, uh, of, of, <clears throat> of Romans 1, they're definitely talking about God being the creator. He made us. And among the things that we're talking about is that we, we are made uh, not only by him, but we were made for him. That should, should certainly influence the way we live. Amen? He didn't just make us and turn us loose to live as we uh, saw fit to live or as we chose to live at any given moment in any given day. No. He has a plan for our lives. As our creator, it was not without intent, right? I mean, you make something, there's a, there's a purpose. We were working on Jim's roof the other day, and that's to keep the weather out, isn't it? Keep the rain off your head, right? You do it. You make a cake it's so you can, you know, eat that thing. <laughs> you like cake. It's for a purpose. God made us for a purpose. He's the eternal God, made us in his image and after his likeness. And he's got a purpose for our lives. And so when we think about God, and that's what we're talking about, is we're wading into the subject, subject of living life from a Christian perspective, we're talking about, yes, God and who he is, what he is like. And among uh, the things that we believe about God is that God made us. He is the maker, maker of all things, seen and unseen, visible and invisible. And he made us for his glory. You know, the, the, <clears throat> the Revelation um, passage that says that we're made for his pleasure, uh, more accurate rendering really is that we're made for his glory. Made for his glory. And uh, that's an important thing to, to remember. You know, the Colossians speaks of uh, the, the mystery which was hidden from ages and generations past, Christ in you. See, when Christ lives in a, in a life, that, that just totally transforms Terms a life, a human life, doesn't it? Yeah. Where you, be, you, you, you uh, begin now to act as God intended you to act. Live and, and hold views and, 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 and speak and think the way God intends you to think. The way he intended you to think from eternity past when he made main man. Amen? That's his plan. And God is glorified. Again, if you, um, <clears throat> to use the cake analogy that we used a minute ago, you made the cake for purpose, right? If the cake was a flop, you forgot to put in half the ingredients and it comes on out, looks like a hockey puck and, and burn it and whatever, the whole thing. And um, Your friends aren't going to come and say, oh, that's a beautiful cake, this is a delicious cake. And, uh, no thanks, I'm fasting or I'm uh, dieting or I'm keto and I can't have cake. And, and, I mean, that's, nobody's interested in that thing. No glory for that thing, right? 
No glory for a failure, for a flop, but that's not who God made us to be. Mm -mm, made in his image and after his likeness. When filled with his spirit and, and, and his son is living his life out through us, that brings glory to God. That brings glory to God. We're blessed. I mean, when people around us are living like Christians, we're blessed by them. We give thanks and praise for those lives, don't we? Don't we? And we are certainly the salt and light to a lost and dying world that we're called to be. Aren't we? Yeah, men see our goods works, give, glorify, give glory to our Father which is in heaven. Don't they? Because God made us for, for those purposes and to that end that we would be conformed to the image of Jesus. Made by him and made, made for him, made for his glory. Well, living life from a Christian perspective, yeah, that, that, and we'll talk about uh, life and, and uh, meaning and purpose for life as we go on, but that should sure clarify where we're going, what we're doing, shouldn't it? To a very, very considerable degree. I would ma imagine many of you share a testimony like mine. When I came to the Lord, I was very soon aware that, hey, the things that I thought about my future were, no, n no longer major considerations. The plans that I had, you know, that were brewing and the, the you know, the aspirations, nope. That was B.C., <laughs> right? That was before Christ came into my life. But now he's Lord. And how presumptuous of me to think that I'm going to now continue pursuing my plans and purposes for life. Now that Jesus is my Lord, those things don't go together real well, do they? No, no. And I would imagine many of you share that same testimony that you came to Jesus and you recognize now it's time to find out what he's got for you, what his plan and purpose for your life is. Amen? So when we believe that Jesus is Lord, that he's God, then, and that he made us, then, yeah, it, it, it directs and governs the way we think and the way we live. Life from the Christian perspective. Amen? Well, <clears throat> that's a little bit of review. <clears throat> um, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 14. Passage that I made reference to just a minute ago. Psalm 14. And we would like to talk further about God and uh, we would like to talk of him as the judge of all. The one to whom we will give account. He's the judge. We'll look first at a number of passages of Scripture. And we won't spend a lot of time on them necessarily, but we'll look at a number of passages of Scripture where um, it's recorded that there are those who uh, don't believe in God or believe that God uh, doesn't see, doesn't care, won't hold them accountable. Not a new concept. Been around for a long time. There are, to this very day, people that hold these views of who God is and what he is like. You're with me there, aren't you? Yeah. There are those who say there is no God. And there are those that would live and maybe even say that they, oh, believe that there's a God, but he really doesn't expect that much of me. I mean, nobody's perfect, right? The nobody's perfect excuse is pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pretty flimsy, pretty thin, right? We just, we see that as a very shallow and feeble uh, effort made at <clears throat> somebody justifying their ungodly conduct and, uh, and looking around and seeing that everybody, you know, lives ungodly, so it can't be that bad. Well, we're not, uh, as Christians, we know that we're not given license to use other people's conduct, failures, faults, and shortcomings as the standard by which we would live or judge our lives. Amen? For sure. God's got a standard, doesn't he? So, but we will look at a number of passages here on the subject of judgment. God's the judge, but there are people, plenty of people, we, we live and move among those people every day that uh, believe wrong things about God and more particularly wrong things about him being the judge. But you know better. And that awareness that God is 
the judge of your life, and he will judge you, <clears throat> does judge you, and will judge you, should certainly sober us and, uh, and be ever recalibrating our lives and our decisions and directing the course for our lives. Amen? Because we want to hear well done when it's all said and done. Amen? That's it. And, uh, and with that awareness, we, uh, we live soberly and righteously and godly. So here in Psalm 14, from verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and see God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Yep. Sounds like the Romans passage, doesn't it? For sure. And they say in their heart, there is no God. Well, we talked a moment ago. That's an easy thing to say if you're, if you're feeling uh, guilty uh, for the way you've been living your life. Uh, you know you've been living for self, living irresponsible, uh, irresponsibly. And so you say, I, that's no God. There's no God. Well, that's a foolish thing to do. That's not the way to deal with guilt, is it? No. Guilt is there, really is a gift from God. He has sent his, only, his Holy Spirit into the world to convict men of their sin. Hasn't he? Yeah. Their failure to live righteous lives. He's, he's done that. And aware that there is a God and that I guilt, I'm guilty before him. No. Nope. Uh, he doesn't drive us away from himself, but he draws us to himself that we might confess our sin. Amen? He says, come to me. Come to Jesus. Come to the cross. Acknowledge your sin. The prophet writes, only acknowledge thine iniquity. Only acknowledge your iniquity. Isn't that something? Powerful passage. Because that's what the unregenerate man, the fool, refuses to do. He refuses to acknowledge before God that he's guilty. He knows he's guilty. He's troubled and he's vexed with his guilty soul, but he refuses to acknowledge it before God. And God says, only acknowledge your iniquity. Powerful, isn't it? That's the way the Lord appeals to sinners to be reconciled to himself. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I go over to Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. Verse 9 reads, Then said he unto me, this is the Lord speaking to the prophet Ezekiel, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth, the Lord seeth not. Interesting, isn't it? They acknowledge that there has been a Lord even. That in times past he was more involved, but no, and now he's forsaken. Now he doesn't see any longer. And that's why we do what we do. That's what they say. They say God doesn't see, doesn't care. He's not involved. There are plenty that would take on that perspective. We take this time this morning because, again, these are the people that were around on a real regular basis. They see God, you know, maybe he's out there somewhere, but he really doesn't care. He really doesn't know what's going on. I mean, he, does, he doesn't know me. He doesn't know my thoughts. I mean, who, I mean God's got, God, if, if, if there is a God, he's got bigger things to, bigger fish to fry than me. I mean, I'm just little old me. You know, why would he care anything about me? God has forsaken us. Doesn't see, doesn't really know, doesn't really care. Well, that's, a, that's a, an easy thing to let roll off your lips or a thought to roll out around in your your, your mind, but it's deadly. It's not accurate. You know that. God does see. God has not forsaken you. And he does see. He knows. knows. He knows not only what you do. He not only observes you, but he knows your thoughts. He understands your thoughts before you even think them. He knows that much, doesn't he? These are things that we understand um, are perspectives that are held 
these kinds of perspectives are held by the non-Christian. Christians, you know, they reckon with this. They, they maybe even have had to contend with these perspectives themselves in the past, but they recognize, nope, that doesn't line up. God knows. He sees. And so the Christian lives accordingly, doesn't he? Over to Psalm 10. I'm going to read a, a big portion of Psalm 10. Brought this along from the New King James. Why do you stand afar off, O God? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. The wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God, God is in none of his thoughts. And here the psalmist writes of of uh, things that are sometimes troubling. You see this elsewhere in the Psalms as well. He sees the, the wicked and they seem to be doing just fine. They, they boast against God. They're, they're totally, they're doing <clears throat> wicked things. I mean, all the attention that's given in the scripture and that's revealed to us of the heart of God regarding his care for the poor, the needy, the destitute, the fatherless, the widow, and on and on. And here there are these people that, that persecute and pillage and... and uh, <clears throat> the most vulnerable. And, uh, and there's not judgment that's come. On the contrary, they're proud and they're boasting. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above and out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches. He lies low that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face he will never see. Arise, O Lord, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. You know, you live in a world and, and uh, sometimes it can be troubling to us to see the, the wicked things that people do. The wicked things that people do. I mean, here recently, there's a Supreme Court decision that says that there isn't a constitutional right to murder babies. And people are up in arms, furious, incensed. Around the globe, there's criticism of the United States and, this, and their laws and the Supreme Court, you know, that, that, that people would say it's not okay to murder babies. That's sick. That is just sick. And how revealing of the hearts of man. We demand a right to murder innocent children. Our Constitution says that we're endowed with certain inalienable rights, right? Right? These are rights that we have. Our Constitution uh, of the United States protects the rights, and among them, the right to murder our innocent unborn babies. You think, sick. What kinds of minds? Have, have been behind and driven moves to authorize and to legalize such slaughter. These are wicked people, we would say. Wicked people. You know, your average Joe um, doesn't move society. He is moved by society. But there are people who are in control. You know, the, 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 the people who really steer and direct, who come up with ideas and, and push hard their, their agenda, their wicked, evil agenda, and the masses go along with it. They think, yeah, it's, that, that, that's the way, you know, the world goes. And you think, man, these evil people. What's in their heart? This stuff right here. Yeah. I'm not going to give an account to God. Who's God? I'm me. In the decisions that they make, yeah, result in multiplied of millions and millions of people, their death, innocent bloodshed, and 
I'm not going to give an account. No. God, who's God? Who's, who's there to call me to give an account? You will not require an account. That's what he says in his heart. This one. God will not require me to give an account for my actions. And let not your heart be troubled. Amen? There is a day coming, isn't there? Go to Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. And again, a longer passage from verse 13. Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it and will break the staff of, of the bread thereof and will send famine upon it and cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land <clears throat> and they spoil it so they'd be desolate and that no man may pass through because of the beasts, though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They, shall, they only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon the land and say, sword, Go through the land, so that, I, so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they, sh they only shall be delivered themselves, if I send pestilence into the land, and pour out my fury upon it in blood, to cut off from it man and beast. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. <clears throat> that sounds like judgment coming. That sounds like God is going to require. He sees the perversion. The Bible is pretty plain that the, uh, the, uh, the, the cup of the, the fury of God's wrath is... Um, is, uh, is filling up. It's, uh, I would, uh, obviously just, uh, just when he comes back uh, is, is known only to him. But you look around and it's, it's plain to see. You know, I mentioned the, the, the shed blood of, of innocence. I mean, some 60 million here in our country alone slaughtered over the last 50 years. Isn't that something? That's a lot of innocent blood. And right from the very beginning, right from the very beginning, the blood of your brother cries to me from the earth. Isn't that something? That first murder? The blood of your brother cries out to me from the earth. God looks on innocent blood. He hears the cry of innocent blood, doesn't he? Yep. And his wrath is about to be poured out on this earth. Judgment day is coming. And... Um, he says, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, when, I, when I'm coming with my wrath, it is going to be poured out in fury. Judgment today is, <clears throat> is soon upon this earth. We're talking about our God and living from a Christian perspective. You know that you're going to give an account for your actions, for your decisions, for the life that you live. Not for somebody else or how, how they treated you. I would have been a better Christian if it weren't for this person or if circumstances has, had been different. If only, you know, these things had gone my way, God. Uh, then I would have been a true Christian. I would have been committed. I would have been one of your, you know, your, 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 uh, your favored few, Lord. But these people didn't treat me right or circumstances went that way and... <clears throat> We all know better than to allow that to be an excuse. The very real danger to us is that we could give place to that kind of thinking. Christians, born-again Christians, entertain those thoughts and should not. There is a judgment day coming, and none of us will be able to stand on judgment day and 
pass the blame off on somebody else. It's not the circumstances in which you lived and, and, and found yourself living that caused you to live the, the ungodly life that you lived. No, no, no. The decisions, the wrong decisions that you made, you made them because you wanted to. Failures to live as God called you to live, that was your decision. Nobody else forced you to live that way. No, nobody else did. Every one of us, we make our own decisions. And consequently, we will give an account for those decisions because there's a God who is judge. Amen? Let's go over to Romans chapter 14 and read that passage. Romans chapter 14. Life from the Christian perspective. Christian soberly considers that they're going to give an account for the way they live their lives, live their life. Amen? So you don't live recklessly. And you don't pursue your own will. And you don't give place to the, you know, the, the, the self-pity and, and excuse-making you know, for, for why you're not doing what you should be doing. You know. You know the Bible says that his grace is sufficient. There's no temptation that comes upon us but such as is common to man. Amen? Any trial that comes our way is common. You're not the first person, you know, the only person that has had to ever deal with the kinds of hardships and difficulties, the, you know, the, the tough breaks. No, they're common to man. And God is faithful. Amen? Does not allow us to be tried above our ability, but with the temptation, the test of trial, makes a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. That's the promise and assurance that we have from our God, isn't it? Yeah? Romans chapter 14, we read from verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I'll, I'll <clears throat> just so that we're, you know, we're, we're true to the context. Um, in the context, Paul is addressing the subject of, of, of uh, our need to refrain from passing unbiblical judgment on our brothers and sisters for the decisions that they make in terms of how they live their lives. I said, I qualified that with unbiblical judgments. You all know, or I trust you know, that in order for us to be uh, appropriately biblically involved in one another's lives, like, uh, which, which sometimes involves um, instructing, reproving, rebuking, exhorting, judgments of a measure need to be made, don't they? Right? I see, here's my brother Micah. And he did a great job helping on this roof job the other day. But there were a couple of times when he needed to be encouraged uh, to try a little harder at what he had before him, right? So in order to, in order, in order uh, what, what, what is behind the word of encouragement to try a little harder? Well, it's an observation that he wasn't trying quite as hard as he needed to. I'm really putting him on the spot here. He's a good kid. Did a fine job. Good there? So, um, at any given time, that kind of determination might be made in the lives of our brothers and sisters that are around us. Amen? You're not doing what you know to do. Right? And so, we, we, before we say something about it, behind that is some kind of an assessment that was made. That's biblical judging, if you will. Right? That's righteous judgment, isn't it? But if I say, you know, I just don't think Sam is a, is a good Christian. He's wearing this South Pole. And any Christians don't wear South Pole shirts. No. Christians should be wearing, what, whatever, uh, you know, Izod, Izod. <laughs> this Christian over here says you ought to be wearing Izod, not South Pole. You know? And um, that is not righteous judgment, is it? No. I mean, I, I, that, would be, that would be unsound. <clears throat> We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the truth that we wanted to spend a little time on. Good there? We're all going to stand before God Almighty and give an account for the things which we have done. It is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every one of us. We are, as they say, free moral agents. You make decisions and they are moral decisions. How you spend your time, the, the way you direct energies, money, the values that you hold, the dreams you pursue. You have been given by God 
considerable latitude in making decisions. He has given to you direction and how you are to live your life. And he has given to you, if you're a Christian, he has given to you his Holy Spirit to lead you, to guide you, to instruct you from his word and from his heart. Amen? And then you decide to do what you're going to do and not to do what you're not going to do. You decide. You decide whether or not to live your life according to this, this, this instruction, this guidance from his Holy Spirit, or you decide to pick and choose. Oh, okay, I'm going to do this and obey to that degree, and when I feel like it, you, you can live that kind of life, can't you? We will all, every one of us, shall give account of himself to God. That's life lived from the Christian perspective. And everybody thinks life goes by fast. Doesn't it? Or don't they? Yep, they do. Making reference to this uh, roof project again. I, you know, was telling Jim that um, uh, next time this roof has to be done, it'll probably be his grandchildren that'll be helping him. Should the Lord tarry? We're real hope. We're, we're really hoping that that doesn't take place. He kids me, you know. Well, geez, Dad, you're doing pretty good for a 64-year-old. You know, wow. And he just, he does that so I, you know, he likes, he likes my help on the job. So he, um, he flatters me. <laughs> Gee, Dad, you're just so good. So, so, so strong for an old feller. I kid him, wow, Jim, 36. I said, well, it's good. You know, it's, it's, not, you know, it's, you're, uh, it's a little bit, little bit late in life for you to be learning how to do this stuff, but, you know, better late than never. <laughs> 36 years old and you're just learning how to do this kind of stuff? <laughs> so we just... little rejoinder there, right? <clears throat> We're all going to give an account before God for the decisions that we have made. And, yes, <clears throat> uh, look at me over to 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's look at, before we shut things down for this morning, let's take a, a look at a few more passages of Scripture. Judgment's theory is business. Life is going along at a good clip. People make much too much of this brief earth existence. We are here and we are gone like a vapor. And we should not get all entangled with or caught up with or disappointed at. If you're a Christian, then you have no reason to be discouraged or discontent. Life is in Jesus. Presumably, the Lord brought you to that realization in the first place when you came to him. Amen? Amen. Yeah, don't forget it. Life is in Jesus. It's a, life, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. And obviously we could extrapolate from that truth and, and say that yes, it doesn't exist in, life is not, uh, you know, it doesn't take on meaning and purpose through all the things that somebody's able to experience. You with me there? Yeah. Life is in Jesus. Life is in the Son. <clears throat> Let's live oriented toward the sun. Amen? In 1 Peter chapter 4, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. That's the way we all lived, right? We lived the way heathens walked. Ephesians fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, right? We're by nature children of wrath, even as others. Peter's uh, uh, reference here is very similar to the Ephesians 2 passage. We have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable Id idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. And, you know, many of you all have... Um, have had people, non-Christians, maybe sometimes professing Christians, uh, and they, they think that it's strange that you, and they'll, they'll mock you or criticize you for not joining them in their sin. 
Why don't you do this? And you should do this. And, you know, if you were really a part of this family, you'd, you know, come on and get, you know, stupid drunk with the rest of us or whatever it might be. You know, lie about this and cheat over there. And that's just, you know, who we are. We've always been buddies. We've been all our lives. And this is the way we live. And now you say, nope, not, not any longer. I pledge my allegiance to the Lord of glory and I'm a citizen of another kingdom and I live by another standard and the things that I once loved I now hate and the things that I once hated I now love. And they think it's strange that you don't join them in all the ungodly ways that, that you used to walk in and that they still walk in. They think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. Verse 5 says what? They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. There's a day of reckoning coming. And thankfully, praise God, you've been sobered to that awareness. You've come to grips with that reality. You've, you've, you've squared up to that. Okay, I just can't go on living like a heathen any longer. Judgment day is upon us. And I don't want to be damned. I don't want to be sent to hell. I don't want to know the, the torment of, of, of fire forever and ever. I believe that God offers me a new life the forgiveness of my sins through Jesus Christ. And I'll choose that life. Judgment's coming. And a sober, honest individual will reckon with that. And they'll amend their ways. And they will, will cease from pursuing their own interests. Here, you know, a passage like this, yeah, uh, okay, he goes in and he talks about all kinds of perverseness and the, 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 the revel revelries and the, the dissipation. And I think I wasn't living the, the most wild and <clears throat> decadent life. I was just a pretty regular sinner. That's included. It's rejection of Jesus' lordship that damns a soul to hell. So maybe you weren't the worst of sinners. There are plenty of people that think that if they refrain from being the worst of sinners, then, you know, they'll get a little, little extra credit on, on judgment today. No, it's rejection of Jesus' lordship that sends a soul to hell. That's why the scripture says if you're going to reject him, yeah, eat, drink, and be merry. Because this is only in this life is the opportunity that you have to do anything that would be even remotely pleasurable. After that, it's, it's torment for all eternity because judgment day is coming. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. I'm going to give you a couple others. We're about out of time. I'm going to read a couple more verses. I'll give you the references. You can jot them down, but I won't ask you to turn uh, with me to them. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37, but I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. And they say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear, Fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And then one more. And there are quite a number more that I have here in my notes. But uh, Revelation 22 and verse 12, you know, the, if we're in the book of Revelation, we're at the end of the book. And if we're in chapter 22, we're in the end of the book of the last book. Amen. He says in verse 12, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. There's a judgment day coming for the believer. 
Ours is not a judgment in which we uh, could potentially damned. We didn't take time and talk about the judgment uh, of believers uh, as distinct from the judgment of the non-believers. But the Lord's coming back. And he'll reward those. He'll reward his people. If you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and do so, not just have once in time past, but yours is a living faith where you continue to place your trust in his shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins, not in, not in your works of righteousness, but in his work, then you're a Christian. And you'll be welcomed into heaven. But still, there is a judgment that awaits believers. People who are welcomed into heaven will still be subject to the judgment of God. There are opportunities that you took to honor God with your life, and you'll be rewarded for, 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 uh, for faithful and humble obedience to do his will and for living a fruitful life. There are other things that we're doing that are unprofitable and that we will, they will be burned in the fires of judgment. These truths should have a very real effect on the way we live. Amen? Why? Why be pursuing that which is of no profit, of no eternal value? Why not so to the Spirit that we might of the Spirit reap life everlasting? Amen? There's a judgment day coming. And, and maybe uh, a significant percentage of the people here today will make it into heaven. But who of us would be able to say, I always did those things which pleased my father? We make decisions. Let us live from a Christian perspective like people who believe these things about coming judgment and God examining our works and those which were wood and hay and stubble being burnt up and those which were gold and silver and precious jewels being uh, abiding the fire and receiving a reward. We should not, the Holy Spirit doesn't encourage any of us to live lives that would enable us to barely get in. No. No. We played kickball out here the other night. Okay? And I was bummed out that we lost. I want a rematch. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Christian lives life not in pursuit of mediocrity, but in pursuit of excellence, to honor God with their all. Amen? Amen. We're not interested in just barely getting by. No, we're interested in honoring God with the full yieldedness of our lives to him. There is a judgment day coming. Let us live from a Christian perspective, bearing judgment day in mind. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads before him. Heavenly Father, holy, holy Lord, you are a holy God and you require holiness of your people. We understand that we can of our own selves do nothing. But we will not, we refuse to use that as an excuse for failure. We are encouraged by your spirit and from your word that your grace is always sufficient, that you, ever present in our lives and in our midst, are our present help, that we can indeed do all things through Christ who strengthens us, our st your strength made perfect in our weakness. So yes, we acknowledge our own inability to, to honor you and live lives that would uh, bring glory to you. We also recognize and acknowledge freely that you have provided abundantly for us to live very fruitful lives for your glory and for our reward. And we thank you for that, Father God. We know that one day soon we will stand before you and give an account for the things which we have done, the words of our mouths. Help us to live soberly, righteously and godly, 
Help us, Holy Father. We ask in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's stand together, beloved, and sing to the Lord, minister to the Lord in song. More than anything. More than anything. Help us to do just that, O oh Lord God. Help us, O oh Lord, to love you with our all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll greet one another in the love of the Lord. God's grace and peace go with you all.